AWS. Is anybody here an AW, a current AWS user? Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay, more than not. A anybody former AWS user, not currently? Cool. Anybody has absolutely no idea what AWS is all about? Oh, Shame perfect. on you. Perfect, 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 perfect. <laughs> okay, so I'll be able to really skip past that part really fast. I'm going to give you a, a fairly detailed update on what we've done in the past year, some metrics, some new locations, services, features. This is a perfect size group. This is the size group I love to talk to, so stop, interrupt at any point, and ask me questions on any part of any service that I talk about if you'd like me to go into more detail. There's so much going on inside AWS that I don't know anywhere close to everything about everything, but um, I do my best to actually not... Uh, not bottom out any questions, so feel free to dive pretty deep on things if you don't know and you really need, if I don't know and you really need to know, I'll be happy to, to research some things. So, uh, preview question for AWS, who, who knows what the first service that we launched way back in 2005 would have been? S3 or EC2? No, no before those. So books? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> books is way, way before that. <laughs> so in, in 2005, we launched the Simple Key Service, or SQS, and I'm sure that people looked at that at the time and said, why is my bookstore trying to sell me message queues? This just doesn't make a whole lot of business sense. But we, as we are, we're very, very humble when we do things. We never go out with a lot of fanfare and say, we're now entering the brand new brave era of cloud computing, and here's how we're going to do it. We simply roll out some services. We have put them out there for developers. So here's, here's the service, here's the business model, here's the APIs, here's the docs, here's some ideas for how we think you might find it useful, but pick it up and, and run with it. And then we, we really let the outside world draw their own conclusions as far as what the bigger picture might be. So seven years in, we now have a very, very broad line of, of web services, all, all pay-as-you-go based models. We've got a customer base that's pretty much all over the world. I think we have 190 countries represented in our customer base now. Enterprise, startup, government, R&D, education. How, how many regions do you have? We currently have eight regions. Eight, okay. And we also have a, a free usage tier, which has been really, really good at helping people to get on board with AWS. They, you can actually go to the website. You can sign up for the free usage tier. You get access to two instances full-time for a year, database services, message queuing services, the workflow services, some bandwidth, some storage, all at no charge. So you can actually put a fairly substantial application online without spending any money, only if you go above the limits of that free usage tier where your account be charged. What's the ratio of people that are using uh, this tier versus the customers? Oh, free. Yeah, so the, yeah. the free tier basically is to get people started, and then people will do some experimentation, and typically they'll, they'll do some learning, and then they'll move on up from there into for pay kinds of services. I don't have a statistic as to how well does the free tier convert into into additional usage, but clearly it's something that has, has worked well for us. Or but just in, in, terms of, in terms of the costs. So oh, in terms of costs? What, what percentage of your users are using the free tier right now? If you can. Couldn't tell you. Okay. Certainly what happens is that we, we have a distribution of you know users running things on one instance, 10, hundreds, I see status reports listing customers that are running thousands of instances. We've got customers like Cycle Computing that launch parallel processing jobs in the up to the biggest one I've heard, I think, was 50,000 parallel cores running with, with cycle computing. And they actually launched that across seven separate regions. So there, there's a, just a huge, a huge variety of scale. So it was actually really fun to pull out the statistics from 2008 and compare those to September 2012, just to see how far the, the cloud world has come in, in not all that long. So any guess for the number of S3 objects we now have? 30 trillion. Just one trillion. <laughs> Just one trillion. We, and that's, that's the number that we currently have stored. That's not cumulative that have been added and deleted. That's the, as of when we launched that, which was a couple months ago, we, we have one trillion objects currently stored in, in S3. I already gave away the, the second answer. We, we had, had two regions back then. We now have eight separate regions with, with more on the drawing board. We had three instance types. We've gone up to, to 14. We had one pricing model back then. We had the on-demand pricing model, where you simply paid an hourly price for your instances. And up until two days ago, I, I had a three in here. I just changed it to three plus because we added another refinement to the model. So the most obvious model we have is called the on-demand model, where you simply, there's list prices on the website, and you pay a certain price per hour for your EC2 instances. <coughs> that, that's great if you don't know how much or how little you're going to need, and you simply launch some instances, you pay the, the, the list price for them. The next refinement past that is called the reserved instance model, 
Reserved instance is used if you, if you have some insight into what instance types you need and how long you're going to need them for. So you can actually purchase a reserved instance for either a one year or a three year term. We're currently doing that at my company. Oh, saving well, awesome. us some money. Yeah. Awesome. We're, and I'll, I'll show you a refinement that makes that even better. So, so you purchase for either a one year or a three year, and in exchange for a, a fee that you pay up front, you actually get a lower hourly price, and the, the net cost, the, the net hourly price is significantly lower when you use the reserved instances. So with the plus, what we've done, we introduced something called the reserved instance marketplace. So with the reserved instance marketplace says, okay, you started out, maybe you bought 10 of our medium instance types, and you bought them in one particular region. Now your company's doing great, and you're growing, and you say, well, our, instance actually, our code runs a lot better on a large than on a medium, but we made this investment in those mediums. What can we do with those medium reserved instances? We can actually go, you can go now, you can list those for sale on the reserved instance marketplace. So you can list the remaining amount of terms. So if, you've been, you, if you bought a three year and you've got two years left, let's say, you can sell that remaining two years of your reserved instance. So you get the benefit of the lower pricing, but if at some point you say, this doesn't meet my needs anymore, I need bigger ones, smaller ones, I need them in a different place, you now have the flexibility to do that. On the other side, if you say, well, I have a, a time-bound project and I'm, I want to be as economical as possible, you can buy these reserved instances on the marketplace. So if you own some and I, myself, not as an Amazon employee, want to buy your reserved instances, I can go and I say, oh, he's, he's now listing some mediums for sale. There's two years left. That is a good match for what I need. I'll just buy them from you, and it's a, actually a transaction from you to me, and we're just making the market, essentially, for that to happen. So that, that gives you additional flexibility there. And if, if I buy them, then I, and then I make the same change in decision, say, so, well, I don't need these. I can, I can then sell them to whoever needs to buy them as well. The third one is, is I think, um, it is unique. It's called the spot market. So the spot market, there's no fixed price for the instances. Instead, you simply enter a bid, and you say, for this instance, in this location, I'm willing to pay up to this price per hour for these instances. There, there's, all kind, there's, there's so much activity in the cloud that the price is going to vary pretty much minute by minute as, as things come and go, as there's supply and demand changes within the cloud. So the spot market lets you get compute capacity at the lowest possible price. You place your bid, but the, the, the winning bid isn't going to be at the price you bid. It's just going to simply be the, the highest, the highest uh, market clearing price. So you can, you can bid very high. And as long as there, there's, there's a nice variation in supply and demand, you'll, you'll get very economical capacity. Um, back in 2008, the only... How does that compare to just buying it from you guys in the on-demand model? It, it's going to vary greatly because at some points there's going to be a lot of capacity. So there's, there's, there's going to be seasonal effects, there's going to be hourly effects, there's going to be changes in, in usage at different days, so different like times half, of the month. half, a quarter? It can, it can be sometimes a half, it can sometimes be a quarter. Okay. But for how, how long do you get that price? In, until something changes. And at a certain point, so, so what you have to do, if you want to really take advantage of this, you need to actually build an application that can tolerate being run for a while, and then you're, you currently, we just shut it down when you're right. outbid. So we, that means you have to simply build an application that needs to checkpoint itself. Did you guys, you guys roll out the Enron model? I mean, what, <laughs> it's like total spot market. Well, this is actually based on reality, though, so it actually does work. I, I believe there someone was else will build the Enron model on top of them. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that could actually happen. Some, someone else could. I was thinking more of the price manipulations and volatility more so than, than not, not ground in reality. Yeah, so, so there's, there's, there's going to be supply, there's going to be demand. And what you want to do, if you're going to try to use, to use the spot market, you simply build an application that, that can checkpoint itself. And that if, it, if um, so let's say it's going to run for 24 hours, but maybe those 24 hours are going to be scattered over the course of, of three days because you've bid a very, very low price. You build an app that starts up, recovers its state from some persistent storage, processes, checkpoints itself occasionally to that persistent storage. If it's shut down, then recovers, you simply recover the state from your persistent storage and keep on going. So background processing, web crawlers, reporting, things like that work extremely well on the spot market. And do you, do you manage, do you abstract away the identity of the specific machines? So if there's like two people that have reserved instances on that market and you want to buy one and you get one for a while and then would transition over to the other one, do you actually shut it down and move physical machines or do you just kind of say, and it's one for one, it's okay. Uh, so, so you actually were asking partly about reserved instances versus spot instances there. So well, I'm, I'm assuming somebody, you know, some of the machines available in the spot market actually are from people. 
letting go of ones they've already That's correct. So, so a reserved instance gives you the lower price, and it also gives you the assurance that when you say, I need to run that instance, that we will have capacity available for you. Mm -hmm. So you can think of the reserved instances as, as on the same physical machines. And at a point, if, if you have purchased some reserved instances, but you actually don't have any, you're not using them, then those actually might be on the spot market, so someone else could be bidding for that same physical capacity. If you then say, I need to launch one of my reserved instances, then we're going to find someone on, on hardware, and if, if we don't have any other hardware, we'll actually shut down one of those spot instances, and then we'll launch it for you. Now, that's, a, that's actually why your spot applications don't get any notifications. So when you say, I want to run an instance, we don't have time to go tell some spot application, hey, hey, you know, we need the hardware in a couple hours, you know, please gently shut yourself down. We, we need that instant right now so that we can, we can transfer it over, over to you. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. So the spot is a very, very unique concept that people take a while to really think of the best way to get it into their application. You can get incredible savings, like over versus on demand, you might be able to run something at a, a half to a quarter of the price. And you simply have to build applications that are able to to tolerate that, that interruption. Some of our customers will even run their websites on spot instances, believe it or not. When, when they're running dozens or hundreds of, of servers to operate a website, they'll put some of them as on demand, they'll put some of them as spot, and they'll very, very carefully watch and see if the spot ones start to get terminated. They'll either launch more on demand or they'll raise up their, their spot bid price. So people are doing pretty cool things with, with this dynamic, dynamic uh, control. Uh, back in 2008, we had this thing called Elastic Fox. It was this really simple browser-based UI. We now have something called the AWS Management Console that's a hundred times more more powerful. The only database option we had back then was you could launch an EC2 instance and you could install and manage your own database on an EC2 instance. We now have something called the Relational Database Service, which is a managed database service. You can launch. You, you simply go to the, the console and you say, I want to run a MySQL, an Oracle, or a SQL Server database. You pick your machine type, you pick the instance size. We take care of hardware allocation, OS install, database install, OS patching, database patching, scale up, scale down, backups, fault tolerance, you can do multiple availability zone, and so forth. So much, much easier to deal with databases with RDS. We have a very cool NoSQL database called DynamoDB. And you still have the third option to simply run your database on EC2. If you How like. will this Oracle actually work in this environment? Because I mean, our experience is that Oracle is so sensitive to having local storage. Mm -hmm. So you, you these things get better all the time. So one of the things I'll talk about a little bit later is called the the provisioned IOPS model for the Elastic Block Storage, and um, we will be expanding that provisioned IOPS model over to relational database service before too long. And so with provisioned IOPS, you create a disk volume, and you pretty much literally just turn the dial and say, I need a disk that can do 100, 500, 1,000 IOPS. And then you can actually provision the level of capacity that you need there. You must be the license holder of the Oracle license, right? You, you, me, who, as you, you, oh, oh, you, you can right? actually do it both ways. <laughs> is it, is it the case that, <laughs> no, you're you can do it both ways. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm curious about mm -hmm. how Oracle views this, because they're a company that very much likes to own their customers. Correct. But you're not really the end customer if you're the license holder, but I'm leasing this from you. So what we actually do, and we've spent a lot of time working with these different database vendors, when you launch these databases, your fee that you, launch, that you pay, you're actually paying for one hour's worth of Oracle at a time. Now, if you already own the right kind of Oracle license, there's a way for you to do what's called bring your own license and bring that license into the cloud. But by and large, you simply go to the console and you say, I want to launch Oracle Database 11G, and you're paying for that by the hour. And it's a brand new business model for them. And what their high level philosophy is as to whether that's great or wonderful or if it is a total disruptive how they do business. Could well, you might you. see the answer to that question not very well hidden in their pricing. So if I get an hour's worth of Oracle, is mm -hmm. that, you know, well, let's just pull up the edge a half a millionth of a year's <laughs> license? Or? Are they, are they comparable across the native yeah. <laughs> They're, they're going to be different based on their own costs. So let's just pull up the, the, the yeah, page and, and take a look. To, I think, like Windows. Pricing. Yep, there's the pricing link right there. What stops you from stealing Oracle if you rent it for an hour? Because it's database as a service. And the only visibility you have is the actual connection point into the database. You can't actually log into the instance <laughs> that's running the database. You, you only get a connection string. 
Okay, so let me actually find the Oracle database. Okay, so these are prices for MySQL. So for example, if you run MySQL on a, a small database instance, you pay 10 cents per hour for MySQL. If we go to Oracle as a base, let me scroll down a little bit. And so when you do that, you actually have choice of five different machine types you can run it on from a small up to a high memory quadruple extra large which is 68 gigs of memory. <laughs> Sounds like an, a, like a, an, an In-N-Out burger of some sort, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Starbucks. Sure, big enough to take <laughs> So an, an hour's worth of Oracle on a small database instance will cost you 15 and a half cents. Or on that quadruple extra large, it'll be $3.14. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. We, our, our costs vary widely by location, so we, in, in each of the different AWS regions, you'll, you'll see that there's different costs that actually, th these represent our own cost of doing business in those different locations. So small works out to something like an equivalent cost per year of, what is it, $10,000 a year for a license? Is that what it is? Did they do that right? Well, you have to multiply 15 cents per hour to, to do that. Yeah, that's what I just did. Oh, okay. I'm, You're better at math than I am. So well, I don't know. Maybe you got a rock. That, that, that sounds <laughs> really high. <laughs> I stopped it. No, that's, that, that can't be right. <laughs> well, so, so figure, if, if, if that were 15 cents well, and there were 20 a day, you would have... Yeah, we'll find my calculator here. I don't want that's about right, because there are pi times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. So divide by 100 and then another 10. So that's about 10 to the 4th. 0 0.15 per hour times 24 hours times 365. It's going to be about $1,300 a year. Okay, so thousand, right? let's call it thousand, <coughs> 1300. So you're saying that you'll do things like patching and stuff that's basically in the background? You just That's right. What you do when you set up your database is you actually tell us the best time for you, business-wise, for us to do the patching. Why don't I just show you? It's easier than talking about this stuff, just show you. And so, that, is that, if we were to buy one of those instances, that automatically managed and redundant and... That you have the choice of either single availability zone or multi availability zone. So there's, there's, a, there's one price for single, and if you do multi, then we're going to actually give you a replicated that's got a primary and a secondary with all the failover automatically built into the system. So you don't have to build or test or script any of that failover logic. That, that's built into RDS as well. But is it double the price or is it, it some proportion? It's just about double the price because you, you actually have two instances running and two yeah. copies of all the storage. And there's, there's actually synchronous replication between the primary and the secondary. So it, it's not actually log-based replication, it's disk block-based replication. So if you do have a, if you lose your primary, your secondary is up to date. You know, with, you know maybe there's one disk block in flight, but it's, it's, up, it's not like a log where you have some lag, you know, replication lag. Okay, so if we're gonna launch a database, we simply click launch a database instance. We get the wizard to pop up. Hopefully you won't get smoke coming out of your network box <laughs> I <was> there. <laughs> <laughs> Yourselves. You know, we all want to like presume perfect connectivity, but I was in a hotel this morning. I, the connectivity sucked so bad I checked out and got a better one for tonight. So uh, it's, it's not as ubiquitous as we'd like to think. So, so uh, MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server. Um, let's see. We could just, well, we'll just launch MySQL because uh, this is my personal account. <laughs> so what we get to do, we, we get to choose any number of a whole bunch of different versions of either MySQL 5.1 or 5.5. So if I chose, let's say, 5.1.63, I choose the hardware I'd like it to run it on, so I can start small with the micro. What are the options for a license model? Oh, in this case, you just get GPL. Okay. But for some of the other databases, there might be different options just, there. Just there. checking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a hot button for MySQL. At least it used to be. Mm -hmm. And so here you check either a single or a multi-zone deployment. And if you check no, then you're just running one database and one availability zone. If you say yes, then we're running a primary and a secondary, and we'll, we'll take care of, of all the management for you. So let's start that out as no. And let's say we need 20 gigs of storage. We want to call it JeffDB, and I want my username to be root, and my password to be something like that. Or not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many passwords in my life. And then we'll go up Jeff my SQL. And we can control the port, which availability zone we'd like to launch. We have something called option groups that are effective only for certain types of databases where you can control detailed parameters of the database. And the security groups, you can control what access you get to that database as well. 
We can do we do automated backups daily, and we can you can choose to retain those for up to 35 days. Um, if you don't tell us a backup window, we'll just do it when it's convenient for us. Otherwise, you can say what time of day you'd like us to do the backup and what time of day you'd like us to do database patching. I'll just leave those both as no preference. Okay, so here's all of my parameters, and I'm just going to go ahead and say launch. We'll let that go. And it generally takes about, I'd say about three to five minutes for MySQL to get it up and running. So that's all it takes for us to, to provision and get a, a relational database up and going. So Jeff, if I have data in there, mm -hmm. and I only need to use a few hours a day, is there an option to sort of break it up in the cloud? Leave it you can actually do that. Yeah, you can, what you can do, and once we have this up and running, I'll show you how to do it. We'll simply click on it, and we'll do a snapshot backup. Once we have a snapshot backup, we can create a fresh database from that backup. So instead of creating a database with empty disks, we can create a database from the snapshot backup. And is that automated? I mean, can I basically, whenever I, my slice ends, it just does it that? It, it's uh, automated in the sense that everything I show you from the console is all API powered. So you, you can build an app that can call any of these APIs. That, that's a really important aspect of the cloud I, I always forget to emphasize. Every last thing I talk about, everything that I show you today, it's all web service APIs underneath. So anything you see me clicking on, anything you see me doing, doing manually, you can write write code or write scripts that, that can do all those things. Are the DB instances dedicated virtual machines versus like your database being created on top of an existing MySQL server? It's, a, it's effectively yet another EC2 instance with other things layered beneath it. So that there's, there's a, a extra disk striping and things like that to give it extremely good performance. Okay. Jeff, what's the meaning of uh, backup retention. So if I take a snapshot and 35 days mm -hmm. pass and I set it up at 35 days, does it mean that I no longer have a snapshot? So what that means is that we will take a backup every day at the specified time. Mm -hmm. We will keep those in Amazon S3, our storage service, and after 35 days we'll delete the oldest one. And so you always have 35 okay. days going backward okay. of, of those snapshots. Okay. So we'll let that one create it. It takes a little while to get everything all set up there for RDS. Okay, so that was just a quick detour into databases, but I love detours, so don't be afraid to detour me some more. <laughs> Any significance to the screenshots on that at the bottom? Oh, 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 that, that was, that was, this was just the old management console, which was Elastic Fox, and this is the new one, which is the AWS management console. So at the very, very beginning of AWS, the only access that we had were some, were the APIs and some extremely simple command line tools. And then people started to build some utilities. Then it was pretty clear from listening to our customers that they wanted visual access that came from AWS. There were certainly some early developers that built their own visual tools, but develop, our customers came to us and said, we, we know and appreciate that third parties build these things. We think that the vendor should provide those for us. And so there's always this really interesting tension when you're an API or a platform provider that you, you want to give your customers what they want, but you also have to worry about the fact that third parties are going to take what you offer and build things on top of it. And you don't want to have some great third party doing something and suddenly effectively take away their business because you then said, well, we should be doing that ourselves. So whenever we do something new, we always try to API enable new things to make sure that there's, there's continued opportunities for third parties to do interesting things. Let's go see how our database is doing. Oh, it's still creating. I get impatient when I can't get a database up and running in five minutes, I guess. So I, I took our latest architecture diagram, the 2012 diagram, and I paired it back to what actually existed in 2008. It was actually pretty interesting just to see how much of a change. It would take me hours to go through all these services in, in any level of detail, but we, we've put a, a very, very rich set of services together from compute, storage, networking, and, and database. Um, parallel processing, data transfer. We've built a complete content delivery network called CloudFront. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Cloud Search pretty soon. Um, as we grow into larger and larger customer bases, we're finding that things like authorization, multiple accounts, users, and things like that have become very, very important. So we have something called identity and access management. With IAM, we actually set things up so that you create your AWS account, but then inside of that account, you can create individual IAM users. They have an individual name and a password. And you can then control at a very, very fine-grained level. You can control what AWS resources and what AWS APIs each of those users is allowed to have access to. So what you might do, if you, let's say you have some applications. Those applications are calling different parts of AWS. Maybe your organization has 10, 20, 30 different applications. You would probably, instead of giving all those applications the account level identity and password where they can access all the services, 
to, for the, 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 most, the best level of control, you would create individual IAM users for each of your applications and then carefully say, well, this first application that uses EC2 and S3, I'll give it full permissions on EC2 and S3. My second application, it only uses S3 and RDS. It doesn't even use EC2. I'll only give it permissions on those services. And this is all administered from the console. So we're, we're finding as our customers start to mature, they start to have entire teams and multiple departments making use of AWS, that using identity and access management turns out to be something that's, that's a must so that they can actually separate the, the different applications and the, that you don't have team one finding some EC2 instance saying, oh, this, we didn't launch this, we better shut it down. And it turns out that that was actually team two's instance. So increasing levels of, of control for that. So let's talk about locations and regions. So when I was last year, we only had two locations. I think we had US East and we had Ireland. We now have a total of eight separate regions. We've got four in the US, including a special one called the GovCloud. I'll, I'll tell you more about soon. We have Europe. We have two in Asia Pacific. We have our newest one is in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We continue to add to the region list. And we, we have, I'm aware of several more under development. We'll, we'll keep putting more regions out there. These are big investments. If you've ever tried to put together a large scale data center, these are these are eight, nine figure investments when you, when, we, when you launch new data centers and make commitments for three to five years at a time. So if you look at the menu, you see there's actually only seven, seven regions on the, the menu. That's because the, the eighth one, and I'll get to it in a little bit, is called the GovCloud. And we'll, we'll talk about what GovCloud's all about. Oh, one, one really important fact about regions, when you decide to use AWS and you pick a particular region, all of your processing, all your storage always remains within that region. We don't do any copying between regions. If you say, I'm, I, I need to keep my data and my processing in the US, you pick any one of the US regions, we're gonna stay there. If for business reasons or legal reasons or whatever, customer satisfaction, they say, I must have keep everything in Tokyo or Singapore or South America, you choose one of those regions, we're never gonna copy, we're never gonna migrate, that's, that's a function you would perform. We're never gonna actually do that on, on so our for, own. For, for a real geographic disaster recovery, you go to a sun guard or something like that? Or? Well, for geographic recovery, you would simply have things running in, in several different regions. The, the same services are available in each of the different regions. So you could say, well, I'm gonna have something, I wanna be on two different you, I want to be on, let's say, U.S. East, and I want to be on U.S. West. So I want to be in Virginia and California is a pretty acceptable level of separation for most of our customers. Or you could say, I want to be in, in two different continents, or three different continents if you want to. You've got that, that ability to do so. Does nobody in Africa own a computer? I mean, look at that list. Well, the whole continent. We, we, we take a look at a number of different factors when we try to put, put regions into play. And there, there's plenty of other places besides Africa that we don't actually have... have regions yet. They're, when we do these, we're making, we're committing tens up to hundreds of millions of dollars to a location. So we, we, we proceed with extreme levels of care when we, when we choose these locations to, to put out. They're, they're big investments. Yeah. So what we actually do, we publish a map called the Global Infrastructure Map. We'll just do a Google for this, AWS Global Infrastructure. I could just sit in my web browser and do half of my talk, it would be just as easy. So what we do is we actually publish a map showing you both the regions and then the edge locations are the small blue dots. So we have a content distribution network called CloudFront and there's currently I think 35 separate locations and, and we, we choose those locations based on where we see traffic coming in and where we see opportunities to give customers a better experience based on the locations where there's, there's traffic. So for Africa you'd probably want to serve content from well, it's actually going to depend on connectivity. It might turn out to be that Africa is better connected to Ireland or to South America. One, one never knows. There, there's actually a lot of really surprising things that turn up when you start to say, okay, where is the best network connectivity between points A and points B? And it's, it's not always the closest one that wins. It can turn out that, that two countries actually do not like each other and there will be very, very little in the way of connectivity between country A and country B. And the best way to get from one to the other turns out to be go, go to a... I'll go through an entirely different one. So redundancy is built in in terms of access. So if I have two locations and one of your locations goes down, the traffic which is going to the other location, the, the traffic going to the failed location is going to be redirected? Well, there's, there's, or? there's quite, there's a very, very long answer to how to go about doing redundancy. So, so the, the regions are the, the high level separations yeah. uh, geographically. The, the, the more detailed level one is, we're going to go to Let's go back to EC2, for example. 
of DC2. Inside of our regions, we separate every one of the regions into multiple physical entities we call AZs or availability zones. Mm -hmm. So any particular region is going to have anywhere between two and five separate availability zones. You can think of every availability zone as one or more data centers that are going to be physically and logically isolated from the other zones in the same region. So for example, if we say, let's launch, oh, I'm in Tokyo, that's why I don't see anything. Okay, let's go back to US East. Okay, back to US East for a second. So in US East, which are our, our largest and, and oldest region, we currently have five separate zones and over 10 different data centers. So if you launch your application, you'll generally put some of your processing in, let's say, zone 1A and more of it in 1B, 1C, and so forth. And you then use a load balancer to then, and the load balancer has built-in redundancies. The load balancer is going to send traffic to multiple instances across multiple different zones. So we give you these architectural components to let you route traffic across multiple different zones. We currently don't have much that's built in in the way of routing across different regions. The, the, we're, we're still exploring what customers really want in that regard. We, we do have some aspects like global, what's called, um, I'm embarrassed, I don't know what this acronym means. It's, it's uh, GSLB, which is global, S, I don't remember what S scans for, global something load balancing. So we do have this ability to do global load balancing across different regions. Mm -hmm. So it, it turns out that regardless of what technology you're using, that, that building global applications that have effectively masters across multiple different locations around the world, that's not a very easy thing to do. We're, we're going to do everything possible to make that easier, but it, it's just because of latency involved. You, there can be hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds of latency from different, you know, from region to region just because it's, they're far away and signals only travel so fast. So, so things that work locally within a single region or within zones of a region are not going to work the same way. You, you can't do synchronous replication halfway around the world with, without building something that's extremely slow. Right. So what, what happens with RDS then? If, if I'm deploying my database and I'm using several availability zones, so you, you guarantee replication across all the zones. That's right. right. So th that will happen in zones within a single region. So those the, the zones in a single region are probably just a couple milliseconds apart network-wise. But I cannot do it across regions. Currently not. There, there's been a lot of requests for... Now, now, currently, I'm saying that not because I know that we have something on the drawing board, but I know a lot of customers have said, please make it easier for me to actually have a database that, that has a footprint in more than one region. So I could, I, could, I could imagine that it's something that we're going to want to address at some point in the future. How about, check how about um, was it Dynamo? Uh-huh. I've got a whole slide about Dynamo. But is that cross-region? Dynamo is also single region. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't have any services that are really storage or processing services that, that have a, effectively a leg in more than one region. We've actually engineered the system to be for fault tolerance reasons. We try to make sure that there, there are no real dependencies region to region. You, you want to, at, at, at the most horrible level, you want to think, okay, if, if an entire region were to have some just catastrophic problem of some sort, Which I don't want the rest of, the, of AWS to be affected in some way. So AWS is nice and safe. Your data, however, is inaccessible, right? <laughs> I, mean, it, I, I can see the desire to build it locally, but that, that seems... Nothing says that you can't copy snapshots from region yeah. to region. We, oh, we you certainly can. have, you know, customers like Netflix certainly do that. But there, there, there's nothing that we have that's built in that, that makes that automatic right now. Well, you can have your hot standby in another region. Oh, you absolutely can. But then you have to worry about making sure you're getting data from... But it's better than, you know, having some out-of-date stuff is better than nothing, which when a region goes down... That's correct. It's awful. But which... There's never really been a, a full region going down. There's been availability zones that have gone down. But the idea is, as, lo as long as you balance across availability zones, then you're going to be fairly well protected about those we were kinds of things. The East Coast storm. What about a month ago or so? Right? Oh, that was April. April. Yeah, there, there was an incredible weather event. That, 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 um, <laughs> and what was the cause of that? Was you, you know, we, the, the outage, the power outage? Um, it was a power system outage system. and a. A, a pop circuit breaker and a, a chain of several things. Now, when when, you, when people hear pop circuit breaker, they think they go in their house and just flip the, the breaker and things are, are better again. But I actually read what we call the correction of errors for that. It was a 3600 amp circuit breaker. So you don't just simply go and, and flip that when it goes. You do a lot of investigation before you understand why it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you are. <laughs> you, 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 yeah, you, you, uh, you proceed with extreme caution when dealing with that level of power. And uh, th there were there were some components that despite a lot of testing that we do, that we do regular testing of, of all the backup facilities, 
something was misconfigured in as far as what was supposed to pop when. And you know, with, with this weather event, we got something overloaded. And as usual in these complex failures, you can't always say, well, this thing went wrong. It was like, okay, this, this one had a problem, which then hit this and hit this. And we, luckily, we, what we do inside Amazon, we have this model we call correction of errors, where if you are the owner of one of these things, at, at, the, at the instant something fails, and once you get it back online, your highest priority job is to understand why it failed and make sure it can never fail that same way again. And so that, that gets reported all the way up the, the management chain to the, you know, all the way, all the way to the Jeff Bezos. So level, you can change likely. the weather now? No, that's coming next year. But, <laughs> but as far as testing methodologies and making sure that, sure that things are properly configured and making sure that we're, that we, you know, we, anytime something goes wrong, there, there's a, a really deep investigation. It's never like, well, yeah, something broke and we'll hope for the best next time. There's, there's an extremely detailed, immediate investigation and whatever it takes to fix that becomes that team's highest priority to make sure that that, and, and we find that iterating on that model over time is the way we build very, very reliable systems. So about five years ago, Rackspace had a catastrophic failure in Dallas. It's a truck hit a pole, mm -hmm. took out thousands of servers. I lost service for my company for hours. Yeah. And I understand things happen, right? Yeah, you, you don't yet control the weather. <laughs> the, the thing that, that really irritated me, though, was the low level of information and response sure. from them that I got. And you have a difficult problem here more than, say, a Rackspace canonically would because there, I've got identified, you know, big iron that's sitting there working for me. You have people who are coming and going on a second by second basis. So how do you, how do you be customer responsive when you have a catastrophic failure? And not only do you have to flip the 3600 amp circuit breaker, but you have to reach 10 million people and you don't know exactly who's on those servers at sure. that time. Okay, a lot of different things. So we actually have a status site. Status.amazon.com. Site. Luckily, I haven't been here for a long time. So we have the status site, and it's broken down geographically, and it shows you for each of the different services. You know, luckily everything is green right now. And if you go down here, you can actually scroll back, and you can you can see. And there's been fortunately lots and lots of green. If there is ever some kind of issue, like there, there's different levels of severity, and what we do is we establish percentages based on. At, if we see some fraction of an individual zone affected, then that will go to what we call green eye, where it's some degraded level of performance for some number of customers, but it doesn't, no problem really affects all the customers. It's going to be some, some percent of, of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of customers. So you're absolutely right that reporting this accurately, you, you want to make sure everybody knows that there's a problem, but there's, the, the one thing, the, the one frustration I have with, with some of this is people always see the numerator. They say, oh, yeah, there's, you know, 10 people complaining. How horrible is that? But they never see the fact that there might be 10 million on the denominator. They're doing just fine, right? So it's that 10 over 10 million. It's only the ones that are actually having a problem that are going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm broken. You know, the people don't stand up and say, wow, everything's still, still working just fine. So I, not, 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 we, we take these things extremely seriously when, when something goes wrong, and we're always working to... Make sure we better communicate it, and also make sure that whatever the thing that broke, we're going to reduce the probability of that that actually breaking. Do you have performance monitors so you can actually see things like latency? Like oh, we, latency we do across? tons and tons of that internally. But we, public ones. So what we would do generally is you'd probably be in the console, and let's see. Well, let me go to my. Okay, I don't think we'll see much interesting here, but we'll see what we can. So there's our database instance. It's up and running. So we have a monitoring service called CloudWatch, and so CloudWatch allows individual services to report various metrics to it, and those are all stored. So for example, in here, well, nothing's really interesting here, but kind of uh, a number of the CPU utilization in my database, and the number of connections it's, it's hosting, and the number of read IOPS and read latency and so forth. So all these metrics from all the different services are being pumped into CloudWatch. They're stored in either five or one minute intervals, depending on the, the service. And you can actually set alarms on any of these kinds of things. So if if you want to know when your database has more than 25 connections, you can create a, an alarm. Is there any way to see like this information? This, this kind of feels like the stat, like the data behind the status page to me, like each cell. Correct. The, this is just is for your. To, but your is there systems. a way to see that for everything I have at once? Um, you like can actually. Well, you can do multiple selections in here. If I had several databases, you can actually select, and you'll you'll get a, a line for each. each it just of feels like you know switch region. You mean like an aggregate view? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like basically for everything that my entire offering, you know, the thirty different kinds of things I have, 
you know, which ones, if any, are performing badly and how and why. Yeah, so you, you can certainly do that by exception. And there, there's a lot of companies that are already doing great in that space. Our goal is to make very, very broadly applicable basic services. And we want to leave a lot of on top of this for other vendors to build more complex things. So all the data that we pump and we store in here, there's just APIs and you can retrieve this data. So if you want to actually pull the data from all of your instances and make something more, more sophisticated, li little bit of code, little bit of script, you could do that yourself. Put it okay. into a, your own graph or your own chart. You can also set alerts and alarms on any of these kinds of things. And you can, then, you can do that managing by exception, just to, so you want to know when, when something goes wrong. Is there any information uh, that um, I can use uh, when I'm setting up my service so that I do selection of um, zones and regions in a way that I get the highest possible redundancy, or this is up to me? Generally, if you have specific concerns, you'd probably work either with our team of solutions architects, or you might just do some of your own benchmarking and testing to figure out what, are, are you worried about like, which one has the most zones available, or where the, the most well, redundancy, you know, or which just, one's historically the just, most reliable? Just historically, so let's say if I set up availability zones that are only in the east, right? Correct. So you just had an event in the east that effectively took it out. Will I be better off if I do east and west, or do I need to add Europe to this? So basically, the question is, how do I build my portfolio so that the probability of catastrophic failure is the lowest? It's really tough to predict the future, so, Understood. of course, so, what, I know people criticize our U.S. East facility sometimes, but what they don't realize is that U.S. East all by itself is over 10 large-scale data centers, so there's a lot happening in U.S. East, and so when people say, oh, I, I've read things online, so, oh, you know, watch out for U.S. East, it's, it's old or it breaks all the time or something, but that's, it's a very, 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 very big data center, there's, there's massive amounts of stuff happening in U.S. East, I've, I've seen, claims that U.S. East by itself is bigger than the entire rest of the cloud computing industry. So it, it's a very, very big set of data centers. So things are going to happen from time to time. There's going to be, you know, something is going to happen inside of some individual availability zone from time to time. It, odds are it's not going to affect the entire region or even the entire availability zone. Well, what I'm driving at, if you have a plane, which is two engine planes, uh -huh. so those engines are never going to get maintained at the same time, right? We hope not, yeah. <laughs> so, Hopefully, you guys are doing kind of the same thing. Right? Oh, as far as how, how we like roll out new code and so forth? Well, that. Or yeah. deploying? Deploying is done with extreme care. We, we, we have internal test networks. We then do phase deployments across individual regions. But when we do a service launch, we'll often launch services on a global basis. When we, when we say, okay, a new service is available, we'll say it's available in, in two, three, four different regions simultaneously. But we, when we do launches, launches happen all the time. It's, it's not something that we do just occasionally. Every one of these services is updated behind the scenes mm -hmm. probably several times per week in most cases, but with a lot of, a lot of testing behind the scenes. Okay, so our, our database instances is ready. So just to do kind of complete what we're talking about uh, database-wise, I've launched my, my database instance. And if I had some code hanging around, which I don't happen to have any code right now, um, I would simply take this endpoint and I would, I would put this endpoint in my, my code as my connection string, connect up to it, and I've got my, my, my SQL database up and running. So I build my app, I run it, everything's happy, and suddenly I've got lots and lots of customers, and I say, what, well, I, I need more storage? I can simply select it, and I can say modify, and I can go from, if I just simply need more storage, I can go from 200 to, let's say, 40, I could enter a 40 there, if I want a more powerful um, processor, I can select something from the map. If I want a newer version of MySQL, I can select that from the drop down. And then when I, I can either simply hit continue, and these will, changes will happen at the next maintenance window, or I can say apply immediately, and it will actually do those things right there. In some cases, that, these will actually do a database reboot, so you have to, you have to decide if you, can, if you can deal with a reboot at that point in time, or if you want to wait for the maintenance window. But that's all it takes to do database upgrades and, and scale and, and, and so forth. Uh, other things we can do, and, and think of all these things as how much trouble these would be if you had to get your database person involved and just how much work behind the scenes. And the fact that most of these things you don't do very often, so the things you don't do very often are the things that you're going to mess up the most. You know, how often do you move your database from machine to machine or install a new database version or, or something like that? Or 
Or you say, you know, we're, we're getting tons and tons of read traffic, we'd like to have a read replica on the database. Well, okay, that's just a, a one simple click, create a read replica, fill in a form. All we need to do to make a read replica. Or take a snapshot, I can simply take a snapshot, give it a name if I want, and I'm there. We also do a continuous log backup. So I can do rest a database restoration, and I can say, I want to restore it to some particular point in time. So this is all built into the system, stuff you don't have to actually build, test, worry about all the time. These are things you can just count on and, and make use of for your database. What's the format on that? Uh, of which? The restore to a point in time, it was a year, month, 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 month? Um, oh, you said write it out. That is kind of interesting. Yeah, you write out September, I think. I would just simply choose from the calendar here would be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just, I was, sorry, I just, like I was caught up on the GID I, I for too. database size and then saw the really weird looking format. So all these messy things that you do with the database are now just encapsulated into, into the, the managed system. All right, we're never ever going to actually get through all my presentation, which is just great. There's, there's too much. So I, I actually tried to summarize one year, and I had to go through 230 blog posts, which I which I wrote written in one year. So more than one cool new thing per day, it turns out. So the GovCloud is a region we put together specifically for use of U.S. government agencies and contractors. It's used for that they are allowed to store data subject to ITAR, which is International Traffic in Arms Regulations. We set this up so the entire stack of the people that are allowed in the data center, the people that built the data center, the people that run it, are all only U.S. persons. And the, to me, one of the neat things is we didn't do any other extra security work. The other, all the security that we did for the other AWS regions turned out to be adequate for us to put the GovCloud cloud together. What so, is the definition of a U.S. person? Um, I believe it's a citizen or a permanent resident is the official definition of a U.S. person. Um, I'm sure we have a more specific one, but I'm pretty sure that's what a yes, U.S. person is. So we didn't have to seek any other additional security certifications. So our existing FISMA, our SAC-1, which is a successor to SAS-70, the um, ISO 27001, the PCI DSS, all those things we do for all the regions are all applicable as well to the GovCloud. We didn't have to seek any other additional certifications to do GovCloud. And this one isn't in the menus. It's not something you can simply decide you want to use. There's actually an application process and an approval process if you have applications that you need to run in the GovCloud. Direct Connect is if you want to do a dedicated network connection from either your office, your colo, or your data center to AWS. You can either connect to the public AWS endpoints or you can connect to your virtual private cloud. And this is kind of neat in that you can initiate the connection for this. You can actually start ordering a dedicated network connection by simply going to the console and filling out some forms. So your partner Equinix, right? We, we have a number of different partners there. So, so basically, if you have something hosted at any of those locations, it's very easy to get connected to, to those. So if you're at CourseSite or Terramark in Brazil or, or Equinix. So the, these are effectively locations where we have our own regions. And what's the highest bandwidth you can select? Um, currently it's 10 gigabits. And you can, get, you can of course, get multiple of those. If, if, you need, if you need something more than that, we're, of course, happy to talk and make those things happen. We actually love that kind of feedback. If people say, well, I got 110, I need, I don't know, whatever's the next increment up, 50 or 100 or whatever. Happy to talk about that. So, so those kinds of things, you simply go to the console, and if I only knew which tab it was on. So, so I was Equinix is a good solution for, for transferring data between regions, right? But for getting data into the cloud is, is a big problem, right? Okay, there's a couple different solutions tapes, for that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, so a couple different solutions for that. So Direct Connect, you, can, you could provision one of these direct connections. You might just want to leave it up for a month and then get yeah, all your data you in there once. Hmm? So it's not between regions necessarily. You could set up a this could be between your facility. If you, have a, if you have your own existing data center or you have the data in one of those Equinix locations, the Direct Connect is effectively a cable from point A to point B to let you connect either way, you know, move lots of data in or out of the cloud. You can do that. So you can actually initiate that ordering process right here from the console. So at which location do you have your equipment? Maybe you're in Equinix. Connect. I'm not going to buy one of these. They're really expensive. But. And you can actually just do place order. That's all it takes is actually get a, a 10 gigabit network connection is to go here and 
make it happen. Now, now that actually does cost two dollars per hour, so I wouldn't just kind of randomly do one of those. But, but this actually encapsulates a, a huge and complicated business process on our side of, of the people we have to work with at Equinix, the people we have to work inside of AWS, getting all, these, all this stuff to happen. This is the, the front end for that complex business process. So you don't accept physical media? Oh, we absolutely do. We absolutely do. We have a, a service called AWS Import Export. And with AWS Import Export, if you need to send us many gigabytes or many terabytes or petabytes of data, we have the, the service where you actually can create an import manifest and you then tell us what you're going to send us and where you'd like us to put it. You ship it to us and we have a bunch of different locations. And then we take that, you can either send us things like anything that has various kinds of USB connectors on it, or you can send us actual devices. Like if you have a disk drive or a tape drive up to some limit of size that we can accept, you ship us the device, tell us where you want us to copy the data, we'll copy that into the S3 or EBS for you. Or you can say, I've got a huge amount of stuff in the cloud, I want to get it out. You can send us blank, blank media and we'll tell us how you'd like us to copy it onto there, we'll do that. So we have customers that are moving, not just moving volumes of stuff in or out, but we have customers, like we have this one customer that is in the, they're in the bioinformatics business and they actually do, they produce custom data sets that are effectively terabyte sized data sets they produce a different one for each of several hundred customers every month. So they ship us blank hard drives, they generate custom data sets internally, and then we take care of all the logistics of copying data onto those hard drives and just broadcasting them out to all the different customers. So we need to go back a step. So we saw you <laughs> almost ordered something that at least I didn't understand. <laughs> okay, Maybe these okay. guys didn't need okay. it. Um, I understood. Yeah, okay. No. So, so now like we'll have Lisa do the rest of your talk. Okay, so the, the idea... That point. So you were going to get... $10,000 a year's worth at a minute a time of 10 gigabits <laughs> per second of something. Correct. Okay. Right. What, explain okay. physically what the something is. Of course. Okay. So let's say you already have your own data center yeah. and you've got lots of data and lots of processing in there. And then you say, well, we want to start using the cloud. We want to use AWS. And we actually want to do something like maybe we want to do a lot of processing of the data that's in our data center. We want to do what's called cloud bursting, where we want to copy the data up to the cloud process it, move it back into our data center. And you say, I'm very, very wary of the public internet. I'm, I'm, not cons I'm worried about security, or I don't think there's enough bandwidth on the public internet for my data to move back and forth, or the bandwidth is too variable. And you say, I just want to have a dedicated wire connection from my data center up to AWS. And there so, is none currently, right? There's no wire currently. Then. Well, there isn't so, a wire because we're, you're just one, one of Right. Thousands of our customers. Uh, just, just to be clear, in my data center right now, because it was put in yesterday afternoon, it only has three megabit per second DSL. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now. Yeah. So then you say, you know what? I, I love AWS, and I now want to get a 10 gigabit connection from my data center up to AWS. Right. And that ordering process is the actual steps that you go through to have us, us working in conjunction with the operator of your data center, get that connection actual established. So this Correct. is what I yeah. so, okay. so you're really, if, if you would click yes, Someone would have showed up within 72 hours from what I saw there, and they would be wiring up my data center, your data center at home. I believe know? so, yes. Yeah. There, there, there's, yeah. in, in certain of these locations, like if you're already, if you are running inside of Equinix, yeah. there, there's a data center tech that's actually just going to be plugging some cables right. into some, some routers or switches somewhere. What if my to data center run out of my home office? I mean, you know, what, 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 so, what so are the drop down? I don't know. What's, yeah, that was kind of, I was kind of surprised that there was just a drop down. I thought I saw it. Yeah, so so what, the, the other thing that can happen, if, if you are not in one of these colo locations, right. then we have a number of data center partners that you work with. So we would actually route you to, there are companies that actually know how to take care of that last mile part of getting you connected up to one of those locations and then from there on to us. Is that something that appears in the um, drop down? I'm not or? sure. Yeah. So, so we, yeah, we will connect, take care of getting connected from AWS to one of these locations, and then our partners will go from one of these locations to your facility if, if you are not in one of these. But these are these are some of like the west the, the best known locations around. You know, okay, Equinix. So now, now I this doesn't help me get data from my office. Right. None of these options is you know, connect my office to this. Correct. But but if your office was if you were running inside of Equinix or if you're running inside of Terramark you would use one of these options. Right, so, yeah, so, so, so if you're running in one of these places, you can use this interface Correct. and almost immediately you're right. spending lots of money. If you're running somewhere else, what do you have to do? You would work with one of our connection partners 
and those are all on our, our site somewhere. We'll probably be sneaking it to uh, that well, facility, well, I would think. Oh, no, no, no. We, well, our connection well, partners would actually take care of getting the wire from, from your home office to a location where we can then... I, I'm not a networking expert at this okay. level. But, there, but there's no simple pull-down GUI like that to make that happen. Not to get a, a person to show up at your house and make the wires happen. I mean, so Savas, Savas would have hooked up our office. And yeah. we're, we're hosting there for you know some some insane amount per month mm -hmm. to get a direct connection into into our cage where we were hosting our service. Right. But if yeah. there's no dark fiber, which if it's out of your house, that's probably true. <laughs> then it, it can take months to get cable laid. Yeah. So, so that's why I say it would probably be sneaking yeah. it. <laughs> okay. So so here's here's the interesting phrase from our site. If you don't have pre-existing infrastructure at one of our AWS Direct Connect locations, don't worry. AWS has a growing list of APN technology and consulting partners who can assist you in using the Direct Connect service. They can help you establish network circuits between an AWS Direct Connect location and your data center office or colo environment, or assist you in constructing a hybrid environment. Otherwise known as SneakerNet. <laughs> right. Or no, that's, that's not SneakerNet. That's, that's wire. Code just comes wires. in and wires you up at a gigabit. You, exactly. In your office. Right, so right, you're 100 right. feet from here, they run a wire from there to your data center. It's right, but, but Lisa's yeah. point is still valid, that mm -hmm. depending upon where you are and what the physical capabilities are, it may take a really long time and cost an amazing amount of money. Depends or it might be easy. Trenching is still only a million dollars a mile. Exactly. <laughs> Is that yeah. what it costs? Yeah. It has been for years, yeah. Well, we had to pull dark fiber at Tesla. So um, I'm very, very, very familiar with this. It takes a long time and it's very expensive. All right, where did I leave my... I'm going to go shut down my database because it's actually running on my personal account. <laughs> How many? I can. 15 I, cents? <laughs> 15 cents? It, it is, but I, I do have a free account, but I actually like to run things on my personal account because then you get a real sense of what things cost. And that, that sounds a little bit silly, but it, it actually turns out to be just, it, it's a good reality check of using things in the same way that our customers do. To know, oops, I left something running, cost me an extra five dollars, well, <laughs> did that by accident, and it happens sometimes, and customers do that on occasion too. So the last place I worked, we did a lot of 3D graphic stuff, and we moved a huge amount of data. And we couldn't, I mean, we were in the middle of downtown Palo Alto, and we couldn't get network bandwidth, because we had terabytes of data. So we had to load it onto media and send it to get it uploaded into the cloud so we could do stuff with it. So our next service is called ElastiCache, and this is distributed in-memory caching that's compatible with the MemcacheD protocol. You can launch any number of cache nodes, and you can launch those again from the console. So if, if it turns out that caching is, is an important part of your architecture, again, this is a managed service just like the relational database service. Launch the cache, it'll automatically re replace failed nodes. If you need more cache nodes, you simply add them to the... To, to the uh, to your set. Now, with, with caching, generally your, your client library that you use inside your application, that client library has to have awareness of all the cache nodes and generally has to do some level of magic when you add, add or remove nodes because that's to actually update its hashing constants to make sure it's actually hashing across the proper number of nodes. But it's, it's very straightforward to do the level of actually getting the new, the new cache nodes into place. You'll probably need some application logic that says, okay, added or removed a cache, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm properly making use of that cache or the things that used to be cached are regenerated and so forth. Are, are you oh. saying that cache is not virtualized, the cache access is not virtualized, so I need to be aware of every single instance of it? That's correct. And, and this is an aspect of the way that the, the various cache client libraries work. So the, the, the memcache protocol, which is very, very widely used, there's a number of client libraries that are able to do that, where you, you, the, the clients simply talk to the memcache library on the local app, local right. system, and the, the memcache library needs to know these are all the cache nodes in existence, and it needs to actually track additions to or removals from that list of cache nodes. All right, we have a new NoSQL database service called DynamoDB. So this is a NoSQL database as a service. You can store as much as you want. When you set this up, you simply say, this is my, my key, and it can be either a, a hash key that we assume has a random distribution or a range key where you want to do range-based retrievals. And with DynamoDB, we, we debuted something really new for us. We call provision throughput. The idea of provision throughput is when you create your database, you simply tell us how much read capacity you want and how much write capacity you want. You do that in what are called read and write capacity units, each of which simply means I'm going to be reading or writing 1,000 bytes uh, per 
per operation. And you pay for your database based on how much you store and how much capacity you provision. So you, you can scale this up or scale it down at any time. So when you create your database, maybe you're just doing some investigation, some prototyping, so you maybe configure for five reads and 10 writes per second. You put your application out and things start to succeed. You watch your, your metrics and you say, well, I'm, I'm using all my capacity, I'm starting to get throttled. You can go to the console and you can say, I want to go from 10 reads per second up to 20 reads per second. And behind the scenes, it'll reprovision to go from that original 10 up to that 20. While it's reprovisioning from 10 to 20, it still is able to maintain the, the, original, the, the original provisioning capacity. So you can scale up based on demand. If you suddenly see that you're getting 10x more traffic than expected, you can scale that database up in a relatively short time. It, it, there, there is a lot of data movement involved, so it's not instant. There's, there's minutes and sometimes up to an hour's worth of work as it's copying data from place to place. We launched this early this year, and it's our, our fastest growing service so far. So what does that look like from the console? You simply start to create a table, you give it a name, you tell us about the, the keys you'd like to use. And then on the, the second page of the wizard, you say how much read capacity and how much write capacity you'd like. So I have really small numbers here, like 20 and 40. We've got customers that are in the hundreds of thousands of reads or writes per second with, with DynamoDB. So literally as much data as you want to store and as fast as you need to get to it, you can dial that in with DynamoDB. What's the underlying technology behind that? It's totally built from scratch inside Amazon. Yeah, it's, it's a, there, there's a ton of patents that we've either been issued or pending that you could probably dig through and figure out how we did things. But uh, we're, we're working on this for quite a while. And it uh, works amazingly well. So you can, you, can, you can provision your reads, provision your writes. You can set alarms that you want to get an email notification at the point when you're hitting your read capacity, your write capacity, or when you're at like 80% of it. And you can then simply go to the console again, and you can say, I want to add more read capacity or add more write capacity. You simply do a modify. And you can, the, the way we have modify set up right now is you can always either double or half the values. So you, if you're at three, you can go to six, and from six you can go to 12, and so forth. So are you saying that you're paying for the provision capacity? That's, That's correct. Okay. Because what you're doing is we're actually, we're actually behind the scenes, we're going to be taking your, your range of keys, and we're going to be scattering those across more and more pieces of hardware as, sure. as you scale up. Yeah, it's, what, it's what's, the, what's the alternative? This is less painful then, because it seems very painful to me to have to try to predict in advance the expected capacity, especially in a if, system where I can't well, predict demand. You, it feels like original Max, where you tell it how much memory you want to use when you start the program. Well, you're, you, you know, provision you something that's really high. adequate for your application. And if, if you go beyond it, what it's going to do is it's going to give you, there's a little bit of reserve, a couple seconds worth of reserve, because it uses what's called a leaky bucket algorithm, where if you're not using the capacity, you kind of build up this kind of little extra reserve. At the point when you've used up the reserve, it's going to simply return a, a, a status code that says you're going too fast, please slow down a bit. So if your application can respect that code and, and back off a bit, then you don't have to provision for the, for the, the high water case. You can provision for the 80% case and then say, if I do get too fast, it's going to slow me down to what I'm actually able to do. So putting putting this in in comparison, I took a a you know our production site, which is running a Google App Engine, and decided that that I wanted to completely rewrite some large chunks of it, and I wanted to do that on a clone. And so I just kind of said, yes, let's crank up 255 machines and copy this from one one group to another, and cranked up you know a few tens of millions of extra IOPS mm -hmm. in seconds. And you know, it, it took you know a little while to copy it, but you know, tens of millions of IOPS that I would never provision for, right? Right. Um, and I, I don't have to tell them ahead of time that I expect to use it about this much. You know, it just kind of auto manages. There, there's a number of different models to do it, and we, we found that for now, th there's going to be a limit of scale of either how many IOPS you can do or how much data you can store. And we found that this pre-provisioning model gives us the ability to go. You you can scale up to ridiculous numbers of IOPS and store, you know petabytes of data in this, mm -hmm. if you like. Are you paying for just what we provision or what you're actually using? You pay for what you provision. Yeah. So yeah. you so can't set an arbitrary max then. Yeah. Well, but you, can, you, also, can. You, you can also change <laughs> you can. it anywhere, right? Because all this is web services. Yes, yeah, so you, you can change it. You could, If you wanted to, you could even hardwire an alert, and the alert could actually go to your code. Your code could do a little bit of sanity checking and say, reprovision. if everything's good, I'd like to reprovision. But you charge for the copy as well, right? You sound like there was a lot of work to double the capacity, you're doing a lot of work. Right, but that, that's just, that's just a, it's not an atomic operation, but it's just one request you make that says change the capacity. But it's not 
It's not like requests or anything you're paying for individually. Okay, so you're not paying, for instance, the IOPS to do the, oh, the no, transfer. Oh no, definitely not. Definitely not. Get the no. data. You're not. It's not spending hours. If you have a terabyte of data and you double the the capacity, it's not going to like copy that and reshard it. it. It'll do that automatically for you, but it's not going to charge you for like a data transfer cost of a terabyte or anything like that. It's going to do. And oh, so there's there's multi-way replication behind the scenes here. There's I believe three separate copies of all the data kept, and it's all on SSD based storage as well. And that's all done for you behind the scenes. So. So it's it's fully redundant. It's self-healing. That that's that's another important aspect of DynamoDB. Is this one sort of pricing model, or is it the pricing model for DynamoDB? That's the pricing model. Okay. And we're always listening to our customers. And if customers start to say that they they find it too expensive or too confusing or not what they want, then you know, we can certainly re, re well, I just I, that, I don't ever want to know the number that I have to know to be able to do that. Well, <laughs> well, um, uh, uh, you said you could double or halve easily. Um, can you add four or ten percent more, or is double and half the only? Currently, thing? double and half. But my understanding is that there'll, there'll be more control over time. Okay, because if you have more granular, then you could just, like you said, um, the, the alarm that you're reaching the, um, your threshold, um, or an alarm that you're falling far below it, can come into your code, and you can dynamically adjust. So if you're willing to pay for what you are actually going to use, it sounds like if you write the code to move it up and down, you could you could manage that line. But if you can only double, you know, but so if you can only yeah, if you can only double or half, that's so one, not one very of the concerns I have is we're we're monitoring mobile application usage, and when people put out new versions, you get this huge spike because every single you know iPhone or Android machine gets notified simultaneously. So all of their users get a little alert. Yeah, well, uh, well, then you quadruple, but then you have half and half. Um, but it depends on. I don't know when they're going to release. They don't know when they're going to release. They give it to Apple, and it just kind of goes into this yeah, black so box. And so, so you might want to put a caching layer somewhere inside there. Well, so, so how how quickly? But I record these events. You know, I, I can't I can't not record events because they had a surge in traffic, which by the way okay. they're really interested in seeing, sure. um, and they can see in real time. And you know, right now, if if I need to spin up a couple hundred extra machines in order to handle it, which you know I would never need that many, but it would it would be very easy, and it would happen in seconds versus kind of reprovisioning and waiting for a provision to happen. Or you know, like we had a customer that kind of said, yeah, this is how many machines we use. You know, this is this is our this is our user count. Well, you know, they were off by a couple orders of magnitude. Yeah. And you know, I don't know going in and you know until it's live, I don't know how much I need to provision. Sure. But but given that our, our reprovision is generally an hour or less, I mean, do you have that much level of notification to make those kinds of changes? So when 10 million machines are told there's a new update, and, yeah. and half the users are little update rabbits that like immediately hit the button, yeah. do you have an hour? No. No. Probably not, no. You have a few seconds. And you know, and it's, and it's fun to watch the little curves, right? But, I'm sure it is, in a, um, in a panic sort of way. But <laughs> Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, 40,000 40, events in a few seconds is, is Quite so possible. I guess this isn't the service for you. Yeah. Either that or I need to have it pay, yeah. paying up here and using down here and hoping that the spikes never quite reach it. Well, the interesting so question is, is it the service for a large part of the market yes. or not? Maybe, so it's maybe not, you, right? you can give some examples of who, what people are using it for. Are they combining it, say, with your relational like service the and then they're using it blob storage? Um, generally, they'll, they'll use it as a component of an overall solution mm -hmm. where maybe there's a caching layer up front. Maybe they're actually writing, if, if it's storage, maybe when they, when they start to find that they're being throttled because they're writing a lot faster than expected. Maybe they're actually writing things off to a, 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 um, a log file and then replaying those into the database at, at some later time, things like that. So is this, are you saying this is faster, so you would be putting it into this and then instead well, of the Well, these are like, or? basically, if you're accessing this from within EC2, you're generally going to get single-digit millisecond reads and writes. So you're going to get three to five millisecond reads and writes in, in a lot of any? cases. If I write to the same record over and over again, still three to five milliseconds, or is there like a? There, there's definitely going to be some hot spotting. You need to actually be really careful because because there's hashing involved, right? Because we've got a whole bunch of machines behind the scenes. We are sharding your data across yeah, those. Okay. If all your reads hit the same well, node, like so so Google, for instance, has entity groups, and entity groups are either you, you control them or you don't. You know, everything is its own in any group. You can only update in any group roughly five times a second. So if I say everything's tied to your record, when I read them, it's incredibly efficient. But any of those objects, can, you can only get about five a second updates on. Them. Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, since you're not doing the geographic replication in real time, you get some great performance benefits. And I was wondering if you got rid of that. So there, of there is replication behind the scenes, but it's within a single region. So yeah. it's all going to be low numbers of milliseconds to get that replication. So at the point when you write something to DynamoDB, it's going to be replicated. There's going to be the primary and two other copies made for you. 
uh, same but that's all going to SSD. Different availability zones? Yeah, th this is effectively a regional service rather than an AZ based service. So okay, there's a good. you create a DynamoDB table in a in a region rather than in a particular zone. So let me give you a, a, a sort of an analogy that occurs to me that's my response to this <laughs> as our parting comment maybe on this topic, which is you know, I've, I've, I've got this great space, office space, for your startup to rent, okay? And we're going to rent it to you on an hourly basis. It's going to be very attractive space, architect, award-winning space. And we've made an interesting pricing decision for you when you rent it from me, which is that you're going to pay me by the pound of employees that you have in there. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to have to weigh your employees as they come in, and then each day you're going to... And there's going to be a maximum because we limited the number of floor joists so that we can make a cost-effective implementation yep. of this building. Kind of like okay. Federal Express or UPS yeah. or something like that. So, right. so you're paying it's good, and, and we guarantee you know, it's going to be high productivity for your employees and beautiful space to work in, but you're going to have to weigh your employees when they come in. Yeah. Now, wouldn't you say, well, that seems gratuitous. I've, they, we solved the problem centuries ago of being able to design buildings so that whatever their other assets are, we don't have to weigh employees when they come in and make sure the building doesn't collapse. I guess it depends on the standard deviation to, of weights. And there might be, well, right, so that's exactly right. So there might be a small number of companies for whom that's a great design, but shouldn't you also have a different pricing model available? We'll have to say, this, uh, like I said, this has been our fastest growing service so far, and when customers get to appreciable size, they invariably like to come and come to Seattle and talk to us about these kinds of things, and if it turns out that something we're doing isn't the best way for them to do it, they're not shy at all about coming to us and saying, hey, we, we've done the math and we think there's, there's a better way for you to set things up for us. This feels a lot like, in, in some ways, the same philosophy was taken as you know, what we saw three years ago, which is, um, you know, you, you're kind of on your own, it gives you great components that are managed and, and I believe highly reliable and, and you know, it's a, it's a great offering and I, and I really like it. Um, but you're on your own to build the pieces and to manage level of redundancy and, and reliability. And, you know, maybe you can get help, but it, basically it's up to you to say I need two of these and one of those in these different regions and this is how much scale I need to be able to handle. To a certain degree, yeah. We, we are, I would say, we're a really, really good parts store. Where we're, getting, we're saying here are a number of very functional parts, and we want you to parts, actually... Parts as a service. Which well, we're, we're giving you a bunch of... To, to go to building an analogy, we're giving you concrete blocks, and we're giving you different pieces of, you know, different pieces of wood, and nails, and two-by-fours, and cool stuff. But the hardware store is not going to actually tell you how to build a house or a skyscraper out of them. You need to actually decide how you want to put those together to get, get that yeah. house to get to the level of of durability you want from that house. So how big is the pricing difference? I mean, maybe Jacob's concern would be not founded if the pricing difference is minimal, but we don't know if I ask for two or tw 20 or 20,000. Well, that's a good point. Right. If it's, okay. if it's $10 a week, yeah, whatever. You know? <laughs> <Let's just laughs> sure, double it. I, I used to know the exact pricing, but I've forgotten it already, so let's just get that from the page. Yeah, so let's see. So you're, you're paying one cent per hour for every 10 units of write capacity you and, configure. And 10 units of write capacity means 10 writes per second? That, that's 10 write writes per, per second. second of one kilobyte. Oh. Yeah. Wow. But, it, but of, of one kilobyte of data. So, so depending on effectively how big is your record. So if your record is one kilobyte or less, then so provisioning in 10 units says you can do 10 reads or writes per second to your, your database for one cent per hour. So if I was doing a million per hour, I'm looking at $10,000 of how often? I'm not good at <laughs> order of magnitude. What, what is this? How many people per hour? That's a, that, okay, $100,000 an hour? No, it's 100,000 times to one cent. No, no, I was, okay. So, so cost is per hour, capacity is per $1,000 an hour for what I paid $100 for. 100,000 times one cent is $1,000 an hour. Correct. Versus $100 right. flat. Oh, but it's, it's not that bad. Think about a uh, sizable network and uh, the, the amount of writes they need to do. Level 3 of at and t The network, content delivery network generates something like hundreds of thousands of entries per second. So if you translate into those prices, it's yeah, not I'm that, just, that I'm, big of a deal. I'm you know, doing the data center-ish yeah. migration yeah. I did yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. And yeah we have actually too. some calculators online that make it, you can go through and you can put in numbers and it'll multiply these by hours into, into you know, monthly costs and things like that. You, know, you can basically say, I want to read or write this much, and it'll, it'll do some of the math for you. Yeah, 
So I, I should be very, very worried. Since you're, you're paying it that way, it's persistent, right? It's just because you provisioned it, whatever is in of there, course. it's yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah. persistent. And I, I guess the pricing difference you're saying, it's all SSD. It's all SSD and there's single digit millisecond right. access to it. So you're, you're getting extremely fast, yeah. fully durable storage. Compared to the black plastic okay. block or the S3, it's going to be much faster. That's right. So you're, you're basically paying for that. Yeah. How much more time would you like me to spend? Actually, does um, the writes, do they count index updates? That's just, it, when you write, it just, it's a write. Okay. Google actually counts index updates, which makes the number much larger. Yeah. So if you've got the time, you go to all quarter to four. Quarter to four, wow, okay. All right, I can, I, I can hopefully finish by then. I love all the questions. This is the way I like to do presentations, so. Okay, another new service is called Cloud Search. This is a managed search service. You, you basically just throw documents at it. You throw JSON or XML documents at it. We automatically scale to make sure that we have enough machines to maintain a RAM-based index for all your documents. You create a search domain, you upload documents, we index them, you can then begin searching. Uh, fasted search, full text search, Boolean expressions, relevance ranking, all kinds of good, interesting stuff. Entity extraction? Not quite sure what that is. Well, if you look in the field and you can determine whether it's a name, an address, or things like that. Phone number, social security number, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, like detecting those in text and then. Well, it's this the term that they're using in natural language processing. I, I would think that that's you would pro when it, when you load documents to us, you can also give us metadata on the side, and I, I you'd probably want to put something like that in metadata. I, I don't think we have any like anything at that level. It's certainly something I can check with the team and see if that's something there. Well, it's just I'm, I'm looking at the applicability of this for BI type analysis. For okay. BI type analysis, you need to basically get some metadata. Usually entity extraction gives you metadata. Okay, so this is something a bit higher level than simply just indexing words in the document Correct. then. Okay. Correct. Don't think we do that currently though. I'm curious about the, um, the import-export service. Is that something that's coming up in the near Future. Oh no, that's been around for a long time. No, I'm, I mean in terms of the presentation oh. flow. Oh, oh, oh um, I would like to talk about that before you leave. I actually time. didn't put that on because that's been around for a couple of years. I, okay. I tried to basically just restrict myself to just what we've we've launched in the last year or so. Gotcha. But happy to answer any questions about that if you. Because I mean that is you know we're we're you know our office is, is based in Palo Alto and mm -hmm. we have a limited pipe and you know. Like, I want to send a few terabytes somewhere or even just like five gigs to yeah. the East Coast. Sure. So that's, that's a problem. Yeah, so that's called the AWS Import Export Service. It's got its own page. So basically, you, you prepare a portable storage device. You give us a create job request. You point us at either an S3 bucket, an EBS volume, or Amazon Glacier, which I haven't even gotten a chance to talk about yet. You tell us what you, where you want us to put the data. We give you a job ID, which you then print out a, a shipping manifest, which you put out on the outside of your package. You send the device to one of our import-export locations, and we actually print out the shipping label for you. You send us to the device along with power supplies and connectors and cables and all that stuff, and we'll, we'll connect it up and inhale the data off of it for you. And let's see, what can pricing. you actually send us? <laughs> Go back. Oh, <laughs> back to pricing. Yeah, oh. exactly. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, Depends on how valuable the data I, is to you. <laughs> I, I always like the technical stuff, so I want to make sure that you saw the, you know, exactly what you can send us. So you can send us devices that can consume up to 2,000 watts, <laughs> that can be eSATA, USB, or SATA hard drives. <laughs> You can send us rackable devices up to 14 inches high. That's like a challenge. <laughs> How many devices at 2,000 watts can I send? <laughs> well, you can send us multiple devices if you, if you need to, of course. And pricing-wise, so it's basically $80 per device is a fixed handling charge, and then $249 per hour as we're copying data off of the device. So we don't know. You want to send us fast devices to keep that charge as, as low as possible. Per hour, that's but well, that, that's how long you're keeping our, our workstation busy when we're copying data from it. Yeah. If you look at deep inside all of our prices, you will find that every one of these prices is actually related in some fundamental way Human to cost. the work that we actually need to do in, in making, making that particular service operate. Are you guaranteeing that you're going to maximize the output of the device in terms of data transfer? So in other words, you know, there, I don't think there, we'd intentionally there, go slow. Well, there there are multiple ways to pull data. Sure, out of yeah. the thing, Obviously, right. So you can multiplex it in some way, or you can not, and then the number of hours. I can't speak to what we do inside, but yeah, we're we're always trying to do things in the in the most efficient way possible to make sure our customers get get the best pricing. So. 
And I'd say part of this is probably going to depend on the services that you're writing to. So you could write to EBS, you could write to S3, you could write to Glacier, each of which actually have their own different performance characteristics as far as the way that you store data to them. And does this end run the limits for whatever your account is? Like if you're um, not EBS, if you set up a certain read or write rate and then you guys are doing an import, does it still need to respect those rates or is it kind of bypassing? No, the, the, these are still going to be using the public APIs to the service. So you're, you're effectively just getting on our internal network when you're doing this is what's happening. But it's still going to be using the same APIs to read or write to any of these services as and far as I know. therefore it does come out of your purchase capacity. Correct. And is also limited by the capacity, which kind of makes sense, but that would be... Yeah, I don't think this gets you past any provision you've done on, on those devices for how fast they can they can run or anything like that. Because when you provision something, we're not putting an administrative limit on it. We're actually saying, yeah, let's no, let's provision something and then allocate hardware in such a way that we can actually deliver that performance. I was thinking, to you. you know, that now now not only do you have the spikes of customer traffic, you know, or whatever the product itself is doing, you also have spikes of import you need to provision for Correct. and keep paying for. I, I would imagine this is only going to be, it, it's only going to use the public APIs. We, we don't have, as far as I know, that we don't, let, let me put it this way. If we have secret APIs, nobody's talking well, yeah, about I'm, them. You know, I guess yeah. the, other, the other yeah. option would be you, you get, you know, 80 gigs of storage in EBS that's dedicated for this, and it just gets filled up and provided to you uh, rather than having yeah. to go through. I mean, basically, so it's 249 um, per data hour loading, plus whatever you have to pay for the IOs well, that and have to do well. Well, right so out. if you're yeah. loading onto EBS, for example, you're loading onto an EBS snapshot, and that's not contending with any other EBS resources that you have. So that, an EBS snapshot is stored in S3, and S3 processes... There we go. Yeah, probably, S3, I think, does like a million requests per second right now, something like that. So you're not going to materially affect that million requests per second with that, your that's device. That's what I was that hoping to hear. Is you don't, basically, it's your provisioning bytes that, that won't be subject to your normal... Yeah, so, so if you're writing an EBS snapshot, you're write, really writing S3. If you're writing directly to S3, then, then both of those... S3 is built massively parallel, right? With a trillion objects, there's massive amounts of parallelism inside of, of S3. So you're not going to brown that out in any possible way with yeah. import-export. Yeah, so if we did, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and if we did, shame on you. Exactly. You and and if, we, if we notice that, then we figure out a way to make it go even faster. Yeah, this, this also gets my evil mind wondering. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's very interesting that I can send you hardware and you're going to plug it into your stuff. Oh, we thought know? of that already. <laughs> and I, and it isn't obvious how, what, what exposures that could cause. Probably some sort of DMZ like a burning. Yeah, yeah, there's... Um, I, I don't know, but I would imagine that these are actually... They're on the periphery of our network and, and tightly connected to it, but they're, they're not effectively inside of our network. I would expect so, but... Um, and wiped every time? <laughs> yeah, right, well, I mean, given, given that this is... So in the relative scheme of things, a, a newish service. No, no, this has been around for like three, three plus years. Okay, well, I mean, how, how many people go to the trouble of designing their own hardware uh -huh. specifically to crack AWS? People try everything might. on us. People try absolutely everything um, on us. Um, so before anything that we launch goes online, we have a security team that does an incredibly heavy duty review. We do outside penetration tests on everything. Our, our chief information security officer is actually a former FBI IT person. Uh, we're we're incredibly thorough at making sure that there are not loopholes in these kinds so of things. About two years ago, we had the president of ISEC uh, present, and he, he uh, did uh, discuss a number of potential security flaws in the Amazon infrastructure. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I don't know whether they plugged since. When, the whenever anything like that is made aware, when we become aware of those things, again, like I talked about the correction of errors, th those are potential errors. There was there was a protocol issue. I think it was related to XML. Or, or so. There's a variety of things. I don't mind saying you also need a presentation. Okay. We, we are extremely proactive about looking for those kinds of things. And if, if we become aware of something, we're yeah, going to... Well, the problem is always with the, what's called the day zero attacks. It's the of ones course. you didn't know. Yeah. And, and there always seem to be more of those. Although day zero attacks, it often turns out that someone was quietly pinging yeah, you yeah, for a long time beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, if you were watching, you would have. Yeah, you know. yeah, maybe yes. Maybe you know, yes. People are. And in hindsight, with good logging, usually you can find well, it. Exactly. Uh, yes, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Your data center is in rubble behind you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another service, and this is more at the, at the user level, the app level, is called the AWS Marketplace. So if you're a a vendor of cloud software, you can actually list I mean, I mean, and sell it in the point, marketplace. I mean, do you analyze it for, is, does this look like a disk drive, but actually it's a high explosive? I mean, 
<laughs> if I knew that answer, I probably couldn't even share it with not, you. Not yeah, like, I'll upload it. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they plug it in 2,000 yeah. watts. Yeah, exactly. There's plenty Tap to set it, it off. off. <laughs> That's a completely serious question. Yes, so it, is it a, actually is. Terrorism, anti-terrorism is actually well, well, I mean, to packs. go way back, um, a friend of mine had a sister who married a Lebanese, and her son was visiting the IBM Santa Teresa lab in the mid-'80s. And he was walking around, he was noticing glass windows from the outside of the building to the hall, glass windows to the data center. His first question was, how do you keep the grenades out? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a different world, and with the network can just FedEx you a bomb, uh, it's getting all connected. One would imagine that they're not that stupid. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would go the other way, which is know. most people would open the bomb up. <laughs> How the Unibomber was successful. Okay, and, if you, and if you have a nice description on there of what's on the, what's on the drive, they'll plug it in and try it. That's also interesting. Uh, well, well, I'll be happy to actually pass this along to our security folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, and you're no longer allowed to upload anything I can think of on the spur of the moment. Amazon is probably a software expert. They mentioned slightly more clever. I mean, like the thing that happened recently where it's not the same level, but it was the interaction. Um, between Twitter and uh, Gmail and Apple Mail and Amazon and allowed someone to track all of those. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was a human error, if I recall, okay. at, at the base. Well, it's policy well, it, it, yeah, policy. So it was a policy problem, it was an implementation problem, it was uh, different implementations, had different opinions as what was secret and what was public. Yep. Yeah. Anywho. <laughs> so, moving along. Yes, sorry. Okay, so the AWS Marketplace, if, if you're a software vendor, you can actually list and sell your software in the AWS Marketplace. And each application that you upload gets a, a detailed page like this. You can set pricing for running on different instance types and in different regions. And so basically this is, you, you can package up your application, make it available as, as software as a service. We'll take care of listing it for you. Your customers find it, they launch it, they launch it from the Marketplace. We take care of all the, the billing relationships and so forth. You, you said you were in the process of getting yeah, getting so set up here? We, we have a, a concern, I guess, because we're selling a virtual router that somebody would install in their instance to route their traffic between their virtual machines. Mm -hmm. How do you stop people from stealing it? Because if it's sitting there in your instance running, routing traffic, you can copy it. How do you it, stop well, someone from copying it? So. The person who launches this, the customer, your customer who launches this, mm -hmm. they don't have any shell access to your instance unless you choose to give it to them. Unless you choose to actually put a user account and say, log in with this username and this password, it is just an appliance there. You get to define the interface to what's on there. So they configure it through some... You would probably set up a, a web interface you know, on, on a, a URL or something, a private URL that you would actually... I, I'm pretty sure as part of the, the setup process, I haven't actually done a whole lot of marketplace apps, but I think as part of the launch process, things get installed and then there's a URL that's specific to that launch instance that you would then put your configuration page behind there. Because un unusually, I think, for other products, we allow this access because we have to because of the way some of the open source works. So, I don't see, hmm. the only way to configure it is to log into it and configure it. There's okay. No you might want to talk to some of our Marketplace folks, yeah. and, and please feel free to connect with me, and I, we, I know the, we have the guys that run the Marketplace. They said, oh no, there's no way anyone could, could, could copy it out. And, I think and Well, was, unless, I think unless you give them, if you give them shell access, then certainly you, you mm. can't protect a whole lot. Well, you can do shell access and like virtual root, like a CH root inside the file system so do they, they can't actually see outside they need those. access to the operating system or just access to like the web web services uh, we give them access to the operating system because they can add packages other open source packages to yeah see at that point yeah. yeah you're you're yeah we're hosed aren't we yeah, yeah. But I don't think that's if, if they can add packages you don't know what the package does you don't know what it's supposed to do maybe. no but it's, it's one <laughs> it of our features that yeah no no I understand but, but, <laughs> but we have so, so, so sugar, sugar and that, even if you couldn't before the package can copy you out yes yep. sugar, sugar on demand basically allowed people to upload arbitrary packages which was quite entertaining for a while mm -hmm. um, and then another certified packages only but it, yeah we had the same problem and people did actually load packages up in order to back up their data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, so continuing on the theme of import and export. So for a, a couple of years, we've had a feature called VM import, where if you have an existing VM from VMware, Citrix, or, or Microsoft, you could point the console to that, and you could bring that VM into EC2. We, we can we basically create a stopped avert, a stopped EC2 instance for you from from that outside VM, and we now have completed that loop so that if you import something, you can also now export it. And we have to have that that little limit that says if you have to only export what you've imported just to keep licenses, keep all the keep Microsoft happy in that situation. So if you've brought something in, you can bring it in, modify it, export it, and you can export that to VMware and Hyper-V and, and Citrix as well. So if you have existing VMs in, in your virtualized data center, you can use VM import export to, to bring them in. Does that mean you don't have a tool that allows you to export one in a different format? I, th I actually think you can export to a different format, but it has to basically be an operating system that you have the rights to, is the thing where Microsoft was worried that this would be like a, a facility for creating kind of basically bootleg copies of Windows. So we have to say, okay, the thing that's coming in has to be licensed, and then you can only export something that you've previously imported. We, we currently don't support Linux in this, but I understand Linux support is, is underway, both for the import and the export. All right, let's talk about provisioned IOPS. This is a pretty cool feature. So with, uh, we have a, a, a service we've had for quite a while called EBS, Elastic Block Storage. With EBS, you can create disk volumes anywhere from a single gigabyte to a terabyte per volume. They have an annual failure rate of anywhere between 0.1 and 0.5%, which is about 10 times better than a, a commodity hard drive. And they, they have a really cool snapshot backup and restore feature. Uh, up until recently, when you created a volume, we basically gave you best effort performance. There was a, a fair amount of variability of performance of these volumes, because they are running on, on shared hardware. And our customers said, well, we, we want more performance and we want more persistent or more consistent performance. So we rolled out this feature called provisioned IOPS. So provisioned IOPS says that when you create a volume, when you actually tell us how much performance you need from the volume. So an IOPS is an input output per second. And a, a 15K RPM hard drive will give you anywhere between 175 and 210 IOPS. With EBS, you can now create volumes up to 1,000 IOPS per volume. You can RAID stripe on top of that if you want even more performance. So this you're, you're dialing in the desired level of performance when you create your disk volume. Well, question. What about network connectivity? This is all great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Net network, I so, believe, used to be an issue. Along with that, we introduced something called the EBS Optimized EC2 Instances. Ah. So what this is, this is dedicated network throughput from EC2 to EBS. Currently available for three different instance types, and apparently we're going to add more instance types over time. And as you can see, based on the, the type of instance, you either get 500 megabits or a gigabit of, of throughput dedicated per, per instance type. So this is just an option you apply when you launch. You simply check that box that says, I want an EBS optimized instance. You, you pay either two and a half or five cents more per hour for that instance type, and it's now optimized for, for even higher performance access to EBS. Is there any way to guarantee that your processing power and storage are on the same bus rather than on the network, or you don't do it yet? No, they're, they're, they're going to be very close to each other in the data center, but they're not going to be in the same rack necessarily. But you'll guarantee 500 megabits or a gigabit That's per correct. second, which would, I guess, yeah, a gigabit per second yeah. that takes 10 seconds to get there wouldn't be as useful as. <laughs> right. So a couple of years ago, we, we only had three different EC2 instance types, and we, we've really, based on just the diversity of workloads, we've really expanded the number of different instance types we have and the number of families. So the, the, the blue family is the, the standard instance types, and the, the vertical axis is the number of memory on those instances, and the horizontal axis is the, the power, the number of EC2 compute units. So the, the blue family, the standard ones, are go from small with 1.7 gigs of RAM, up to the extra large, which has 15. Um, the next size is called the micro, that's that yellow one. This, this is a very, very low end instance type. It, it has a, a burstable CPU model, just 600 megs of RAM, uh, great for serving up personal websites, good for doing little web crawlers, little, little tiny temporary applications, test applications, things like that. The red ones are called the high memory instances, either 17, 34, or 68 gigs of RAM per instance are the, the red ones on the left. The, the green ones have a lot of CPU power. Those are the high CPU instances, both the medium and the large. Those have 
proportionate to the amount of memory they have, they have a lot more CPU per, per unit of memory there. So those are kind of the mainstream ones on the left. The ones on the right, everything from that orange one to the right, these are all a bit more special purpose. So for example, the, the CG1.4 Extra Large uh, has a bunch of memory, but it also has two NVIDIA Tesla GPU cards in there. So you want to do very high performance, very large scale parallelism that the GP GPU cards, as they are called, let, let you do that. So that's called a cluster GPU instance. Okay. The, the dark black ones are the cluster compute instances, lots of memory and very high power compute. So at the high end, we've got the CC2.8 extra large, which has 60 and a half gigs of RAM and 88 EC2 compute units. So a very, very high powered machine. And the newest machine, that red one up in the, the corner, is called the High IO Quadruple Extra Large. This is for high IO workloads. It has eight virtual cores and a total of 35 EC2 compute units both HVM and PV virtualization, the, the two virtualization types, lots of network connectivity, and then two terabytes of local SSD storage. So SSD storage is extremely high performance when compared to anything else, 120,000 random reads per second, and anywhere between 10 and 85,000 writes per second based on the, the span, what they call the LBA span of the writes that you're doing to the disk. So this is, this is the, the high end for extremely I.O. intensive workloads and, and like software builds and databases and NoSQL databases and things like that. You could run those on the, the high I.O. quad extra large. Three bucks an hour in U.S. East and 341 in the U.S. West. Okay, just one more service and we'll kind of wrap up. Actually, two more. So we rolled out an archiving service called Amazon Glacier. This was, I think, just last month. Everything kind of fades into the past really quickly at Amazon. Things move so fast. So Glacier is designed for very long-time archive storage of immutable data. Designed for 11 nines of durability, just like Amazon S3. And data storage is one cent per gigabyte per month, whereas S3 is 14 cents per gigabyte per month. So the, the model with Glacier, you create, inside your account, you create a vault container, and then you upload any number of archives. Each archive can be up to 40 terabytes in size. When you store data inside Glacier, it's automatically encrypted with AES-256. It's stored in immutable form. You can't overwrite data when you store it in, in Glacier. And we can offer storage at this very, very low price because, like a Glacier, the retrieval is actually very, very slow. With S3 and the other storage models, you write something and then you can read it back in a number of milliseconds. You can get it back essentially right away as soon as you need it. With Glacier, it's a batch-based model. What you do is you create a retrieval job for Glacier. You send that retrieval job to us. You give us a notification channel so that we can tell you when it's ready. And then sometime in the future, up to four hours in the future, we will lazily get around to actually having your data ready for you. We'll retrieve it from, from, from storage. We'll put it where you can get to it more quickly. And we'll give you a notification that says, your data is now available. Here's the URL. You now have 24 hours to fetch it before it actually vanishes from that, from that fast storage. So as long as you can tolerate that, that four hours of latency, you can store data at one penny per gigabyte per month. So this is, this is incredibly cheap compared to any other way to store data online to be able to get it back that quickly. Where would you get an alternative to, say, like Iron Mountain for the long term, like escrow accounts? You could definitely use it for that. Any cost for getting data in and out? There, there's no charge to transfer data in. There, there's a relatively complicated pricing model for retrieving data, where the, the pricing model is based on how much you retrieve and how quickly you need to get it back. I, I have to actually admit, I, I wrote the blog post for this right before I went on vacation, and then one of my colleagues actually put the pricing model into the blog post, and I never